All right, thank you for joining us today. I'm Matt Stelter with the Better Breeder Institute. Today, we're gonna to be joined by the always popular Dr. Marty Greer. As many of you know, Marty is one of the most sought after canine repro experts in the country. For me personally, Marty has been my repro vet for many years. In addition to her being a nationally respected veterinarian, she wears many hats that give her a great perspective on the sport of purebred dogs and conservationist dog breeding. Today, we will hear more about her and her insights on several topics related to modern dog breeding and the future of our breeds. This breeder conversation is being brought to you in collaboration between Better Breeder Institute and Revival Animal Health. In addition to Dr. Greer's many titles, she is the Director of Veterinary Services for Revival, and many of you have likely attended her webinars with them. If you're like us, we place our Revival puppy supply order before every litter. Revival Animal Health has become the breeder's best source for puppy and whelping products. Revival is also the home of Breeder's Edge, the first and only brand dedicated solely to providing the products and plans you need to keep your dams, sires, and litters at their healthiest. Discover them today at RevivalAnimal.com. Here at the Better Breeder Institute, we serve the conservationist dog breeding community, purposeful purebred dog breeders who are committed to the preservation and advancement of their breed. We endeavor to educate, support, and promote these breeders so that they can improve their breeding programs and differentiate themselves from the backyard, for-profit, and commercial breeders. We also offer several free digital tools and services to our breeders, including the Better Breeder Directory and Stud Dog Register. We encourage you to check out these services and utilize any tool that will provide value to your breeding program. Go to betterbreeder.org and click apply to create your account and unlock your free breeder services. We, for those of you that don't have a modern mobile friendly website, we have launched the Ultimate Breeder website. This revolutionary platform allows non-techie dog breeders to easily create a world-class website that will win on Google. After all, Google is where 90% of all puppy purchases begin. This website builder was built by breeders for breeders. Further, if you'd rather have an expert web designer create your site for you, we offer professional design services to get your website project across the finish line. And finally, coming in early April, we will be offering our spring masterclass titled, How to Recession Proof Your Puppy Sales. We will cover the five best digital strategies to sell your puppies without spending a cent on advertising. In addition to these strategies, we're gonna cover the pros, cons, and tactics for each channel so that you can construct the perfect marketing plan for your breeding program. Make sure to create your own Better Breeder account to receive access to this free live masterclass. And with that, let's get started. Today's interview is with Dr. Marty Greer. Not only is Marty a nationally respected veterinarian, but she is a leading expert in canine reproduction and pediatrics, as well as an author, attorney, entrepreneur, business owner, and a very popular keynote speaker. And what some may not realize, she is also a purebred conservationist dog breeder herself. She breeds Pembroke Welsh Corgis and Danish Swedish farm dogs along with her husband, Dr. Dan Griffiths, under the Double G kennel name. Dr. Greer has valuable insights on breeder topics well beyond just canine health and reproduction. And today, we're gonna to get into some of those topics with her. If you have questions during our conversation, please note them to put in the chat later. And at the end, we will get to as many as we can. The Q&A portion of Dr. Greer's presentations are always a favorite. So without any further ado, let's bring on Dr. Marty Greer. Good evening. Hello, Marty. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. It's good to see you. Thanks. It's fun to be here. Thank you for taking this time for conversation with this uh, special audience. So let, let's jump right in, Marty. Many in the audience are likely very familiar with your veterinary career. 
but not as much with you as a breeder. Okay. How did you get started with purebred dogs? When I was about 10 years old, we lived in Arizona and the neighbors across the fence from us, there was a short stone fence across the backyard had Pembroke Welsh Corgis. Um, my sisters and my dad were allergic to dogs, so there were no dogs or cats in our household. I had fish, I had chickens, I had reptiles, I didn't have any dogs or cats, nothing furry. But our neighbors had these beautiful Pembroke Welsh Corgis. Um, in fact, the very old Howell book that has the little um, Pembroke Welsh Corgis on the cover, inside the first picture is a photograph of the actual dogs that I grew up in the backyard of. Um, the dogs were owned by Marion and Ruth Welburn, who were um, residents of Arizona, not too far from Sun City, which is a whole other story how Sun City and the Welburns interacted with um, some other things. But I got a chance to take care of their dogs when they would travel. So I would go over to their house, um, go around into the house, and then into the yard and let the dogs out, let the dogs in, do all that stuff. Um, and sometimes my dad had to come over and rescue me because the dogs would herd me back into the yard as I was trying to leave or back into the house. So he'd have to come call them over the fence. Um, so that was Mike, Ike, and Betsy were the first corgis, the first purebred dogs I really got to know. So I decided when I was 10 that I was going to grow up and have corgis. And well, you know, the rest is kind of history. I went to vet school, it took me 25 years to get my first corgi. So for the people that say, oh, I need to get a corgi next week, I'm like, yeah, you know, it probably takes a little longer than next week. We don't just pull it, come off the shelf. So that was my first experience with, with purebreds, and um, I've fallen in love with corgis ever since. Terrific. Um, you mentioned a few names, but who are your largest influences in your breeding career, either as direct mentors or those that just provided you with inspiration for your breeding program? Um, I got my first corgi from Lynn Brooks, which is Busy Bees Kennel. She's still around. Um, my co-breeders that I've bred quite a few litters with and have had a lot of input with the selecting breeding stock have been Yolanda Linninger, um, Betsy Orman, Janet Bodine, um, Yvette Husler, some of the really strong uh, corgi people. And then, of course, some of the other people that are a little less um, in my direct line. Uh, so a lot of great corgi people have helped me with those breeding programs. And then about almost 10 years ago now, I got into Danish Swedish farm dogs as well. Um, and that uh, those dogs came from Erica Carlson in Sweden and from Lars Eidheimer in Sweden as well. So I've had some really great opportunities. As far as veterinary mentors, I would say Amelia Toomey, who um was one of my first bosses, not my first boss, but very close to my first boss. Uh, wor worked with a lot of breeders. I worked there from my second year in veterinary school till my sixth year out. And um, I learned a lot about breeders. I learned a lot about sharp haze and purebred dog be breeders and um, how to run a veterinary practice. I learned a lot from, from Dr. Toomey as well. So I've had some really great people in my life. Um, and I was actually just getting a text a few minutes ago from the wife of a veterinarian in Arizona. Again, um, I spent some time down there when I was a senior in veterinary school and Dwayne Anderson um, taught me a lot about veterinary practice as well. So I've had some great mentors. What would you say are the major highlights of your breeding career or the moments you're most proud of? Um, one of the little gals that we bred, uh, she was born in 2013, won our national in 2016 under our kennel name. Um, so that was Patty's, that kind of girl. Uh, so double G's Patty, that her, well, Patty's not her name, but that kind of girl, her call name is Patty. Um, Janet Bodin and, and um, Yolanda Lininger actually own her. Um, they took one look at her as a puppy. Janet judged her at the Waukesha uh, puppy match one year when she was a baby and she called Yolanda and said, this one's coming home with us. Um, they told me flat out, I wasn't good enough to have her. <laughs> so she went to live with Janet and Yolanda and they've done great things for her show career. Um, my Danish Swedish farm dog, my import, my first one, Olga, was the first Danish Swedish farm dog to get a certificate of merit in the US. So as she came up from FSS, they're still in miscellaneous right now. So they're not fully AKC registered yet. 
but were um, past FSS and into miscellaneous. She was the very first Danish Swedish farm dog to get a CM. So we're really proud of that too. So we've had, we've had some pretty great things happen. And then probably the greatest veterinary accomplishment was in 2020, I received the John Steiner Award from the Theriogenology Group. Um, that requires a unanimous vote from the board of directors for the Society for Theriogenology and the American College of Theriogenology. And I'm not board certified in Therio, but this is for a practitioner that has um, demonstrated some skills in Therio. And it's a, it's a vote from your peers. So to me, that's probably the most honored um, accomplishment I've had in veterinary medicine. Outstanding. For me, growing up in purebred dogs here in Wisconsin, you've been on a repro vet for several decades. However, as if owning and operating a major clinic like yours wasn't a big enough job, you've always aggressively pursued other opportunities and challenges, both in and out of dogs. Where does that drive and passion come from? I don't know. I mean, my parents always taught me to work hard, and so I have. And you know, I didn't go looking for my job at Revival. They came looking for me when Doc B was retiring. So that was um, kind of a fun thing to get to do because I love educating breeders. I love edu educating clients. I love working with breeders. And, you know, as you probably all know, some breeders don't have a great reputation in the veterinary community. But early on, I learned how much fun breeders were to work with and, and how much I enjoyed doing that. So I just kind of, you know, did that. And then um, we started another uh, practice down in Madison, Sun Prairie, um, a year and a half ago. So, um, you know, we've just, we've just had the opportunities to do some pretty fun things. And I have a husband that's very supportive and loves what we do. Um, we talk every now and then about, well, maybe we should retire. And he's like, why? Because we're doing all the fun stuff we want to do. We're traveling. Um, I'm getting a chance to speak in lots of places. We get to practice great medicine. We have amazing associates, a great team, um, three great practices. Why, why would we quit? Because we're just having fun. Terrific. You mentioned your position with Revival, which I believe is Director of Veterinary Services. Yes. Um, you know, for me, Revival reminds me so much of a company that I had deep connections with, um, Doctors Foster and Smith. My first job there when I got my driver's license at age 16 was stocking pet products in their warehouse. And my time with the company um, spanned over 20 years. It was a Midwest-based, privately held pet supply company that deeply valued the education of their customers, yes. pet owners, the breeders. So when I think of Revival, I think of Doctors Foster Smith, and I'm glad we again have a company like that that we breeders can support. Yeah, and they, they do a great job. They've got good family values. They have probably the best customer service in the industry. I think they're they're really amazing people to work with and work for. So yeah, and they, they really have dedicated themselves to uh, breeders, um, to making sure that breeders are well-educated. We have a learning center with has that has webinars and videos and articles. And, you know, to us, it's really important that we have an educated client base. And, you know, it's just really an enjoyable opportunity for me to have to talk to people all across the country um, whether they're having good times or bad, that we can help them out with some things to improve their breeding programs. Terrific. So let's talk a little bit about your book, um, Your Pandemic Puppy. In fact, it's sitting right here. <laughs> um, we re recently finished recording our second digital course here at the Better Breeder Institute. And in a section covering the support that better breeders need to provide for puppy buyers, I spoke about this book, recommending that all breeders should include a copy of it in their puppy packets. I strongly feel it is the preeminent new puppy book that every family should read, regardless if it's their first puppy or just the next one in a long line of puppies. Can you speak about your book, the inspiration for it, and how it came to be? You know, it's a it's a great question because this morning I had a client in the exam room, my first appointment of the morning, with their three-year-old uh, golden doodle. And at the end of the appointment, the gentleman who was with the puppy or the three-year-old dog said to me, I believe you told me that my wife was your inspiration for the book. And I said, oh, I said, she's the one that's the teacher. And he said, you remember her? And I said, oh, yes, I do. Um, she had come into the clinic with um, 
tech, my technician in the room was Lisa. She came in with her new puppy and we were getting some things together for her, for her first puppy visit. And we spent a little over 45 minutes in the exam room with her because she had never had a dog before. She was at home trying to teach from home, had two kids at home, had a husband, had a new puppy. And we're watching her through the exam room door with this puppy wandering around on the exam table with nobody's hands holding the puppy on the edge of the table. And I was like, oh, oh dear. Oh my goodness. Um, this, this woman needs, she needs some help. So um, we went through all the material that we could in that 45 minute appointment, sent her home with all the supplies, all the stuff she needed. But you could see she was pretty much gobsmacked by the amount of information that it was going to take for her to successfully raise a young puppy while she was teaching from home and raising her kids and all the other stuff. So I came out of the exam room and I said to Lisa, our exam room materials are hopelessly out of date. I didn't write them in the first place. We purchased them and we need to update this. So I was driving home and I thought, you know, there's some interesting differences in different generations of puppy owners. So there's millennials and there's boomers and there's, you know, Gen Z's and Gen Xers. And uh, so we need to we need to distinguish these different kinds of breeders or owners and kind of figure out what we can do to help different ones. So. I was thinking that I was going to do something with that. And I called Laura Reeves, who's one of my contacts and one of my friends in the dog world, Pure Dog Talk. And I called her and said, do you know anybody that would help me publish a book? And she goes, I have just the person for you. She said, Denise um, will be perfect. So I contacted Denise Revedon um, Publishing and Revedon Ridgebacks. I called her and I said, this is what I'd like to write. And she said, oh, I like the idea, but no, no, no. We're going to write the pandemic puppy book first. So that was about three weeks into um, the, the pandemic when we didn't really know how long this thing was going to last. But even that early on in April of that year, we could see that there was a lot of buzz. I had people in one ear saying, what are all these rescues going to do? What are all these breeders going to do? Um, and I had other people saying, well, what's going to happen when these people go back to work, go back to school, they're going to have puppies with separation anxiety, and they're going to have puppies with housebreaking issues. They're not going to be crate trained. All these, you know, all these things were predicted that, these huge numbers of dogs were going to flood back into rescue and back into shelters. So I'm thinking, okay, we need to do something to try and get as many puppies successfully into permanent homes as we can, because we could see the, the swell of people that were looking to get dogs. And of course the rescues and shelters didn't have their facilities open. So they were putting dogs into foster care. Dogs were moving all over the country really pretty quickly. So I talked to her in April and by Thanksgiving, we had the book published, um, which if anybody's ever published a book knows that that's kind of an accomplishment. Um, so about half of the book covers uh, medical stuff. So there are changes in spay and neuter recommendations, changes in vaccination protocols, changes in flea and tick medications. We've seen orals come to market. You know, there's a lot of things that have changed in veterinary medicine in the last 10 years. So if the last time somebody had a puppy was 5, 10, 15 years ago, things have changed significantly. Plus, we wanted to talk about the behavioral issues, especially separation anxiety and how to try to prevent it. Um, I've done some immersion classes in behavior through the VMX and NAVC North American Veterinary Conference. So I've done two of those. So we wanted to bring to the table housebreaking and leash training and crate training and preventing separation anxiety, dealing with generalized anxiety, because a lot of the rescue dogs we see come through have a lot of anxiety. And I just wanted to kind of shine a light on some of those things to say, if you have a dog with anxiety, it's okay to talk to your veterinarian about it. It's okay to say, I need help with some pharmaceutical medications. So we just wanted to really shine a light on some of these things that don't get talked about enough because most veterinarians don't have the time in the exam room to cover the materials. Most uh, veterinarians are kind of reluctant to change their spay and neuter protocols. A lot of breeders and um, dog owners know that these things are changing, that there's publications, but they don't know really how to talk about it. And I've had clients send great materials home with puppies when they buy them, but they're in notebooks and they're kind of, you know, pieces of paper floating around, copied from this and downloaded from that. And so I really wanted to put it together in one cohesive uh, book that has that information in it in one place. And I'd say Denise did a tremendous job of the layout and the spacing on the pages and the white space and the, the, the ease of finding things in the book and how easy it is to read this book. Um, I send it home with every puppy owner that comes into our practice. And I have kids that are 10, 11, 12 years old that can read this uh, material. So it's written so that it's a really digestible piece of information. So I hope people find it really helpful. Yeah, you mentioned, I guess when I went through it, 
it was the readability. It was such an enjoyable piece of content to go through. But then being someone who's been in dogs my entire adult life and most of my childhood, it was so common sense, you know, but yet they're the type of things you probably just assume everybody knows that, but not every puppy buyer does. Mm -hmm. And it just, it really does an incredible job of level setting that puppy buyer. So they're coming in at such a greater, you know, position of advantage to succeed with that new puppy. Well, and, you know, 40 years in the exam room, I've learned something about what questions people ask. Um, I had multiple new puppies in today and I looked at one guy and I, it was a gentleman who had come in by himself. Wife is at home. She's a stay at home mom. Um, the three kids are home with her. And I said, so when you get home, because he, he had a list of the things he was supposed to ask. I said, so when you get home and you don't have every single answer because you know, how wives are. We try to drill into our husbands like, okay, I know you took the dog to the vet today, but I'm pretty sure you didn't get everything taken care of you were supposed to. So I said, here's this book so that if there's something we didn't talk about today, you can just open it up and hopefully it'll be in there. I'm going to say 95% of her questions are probably going to be covered in the book. So it, it saved a lot of time in our exam rooms. It saved a lot of um, time in other people's lives. And I really hope it keeps a lot of dogs in permanent homes that might have otherwise gotten lost along the way and ended up in rescue or, or rehomed because that's not what we want for these pandemic puppies. We want them to be in their permanent homes. You mentioned how quickly you got it published. I have to admit, I'm a little jealous of how fast you work. Um, I believe you started writing that book at the same time I started writing the curriculum for our first digital course. That course is set to launch later this spring. Um, this book has been on the shelf here for uh, two years. So you work very well. Yeah, well, there wasn't a full appointment schedule during that time period because we were shut down by the sure. state of Wisconsin. So I would come home from work with a little extra time on my hands. and so. You know, I instead of being frustrated, other people were sitting at home and, you know, they were making sourdough bread and there's nothing wrong with sourdough bread because I love baking. But it was just a, sort of an outlet when everyone else was frustrated. I'm like, I'm going to do something. Uh, Marty, for breeders that wish to provide their puppy buyers with a copy of your book, where can they find it? They can contact Denise at Revadon Publishing. Um, we can probably get a link up for some of that information. Uh, so that they can find her. Um, and she will sell multiple copies of the book. I believe the current price is $10 a copy. I'm not sure. I so. um, but when I'm selling a puppy to somebody, I just tell them they have to have a copy of the book and they have to go through it and read it before I will sell them a puppy before they can take home a puppy. And I can tell if they've read it or not because I know what's in the book. Um, so you don't have to say, well, what's on page 42 to make sure that they've read it. But you can pretty well tell by their conversation that they've gone through some of the material and they understand some of the, the concepts. You know, there's some fun things in there that I think, like you said, are common sense, but some things that are, I hope are a little creative and that people haven't often had to use because part of raising puppies during the pandemic was how to give them enrichment and socialization in an era that you couldn't take them anywhere with you. And, you know, a lot of people at dog shows right now are saying, oh yeah, you know, he's a pandemic puppy. Well, that's really not an excuse for the judge not to be able to handle the dog on the, on the um, exam. So um, we wanted to give some people, a lot of people, a sort of a refreshing look at ways that they could raise puppies successfully in that kind of isolated situation. Terrific. So let's shift gears a little bit um, to some of the topics that I think this audience is probably really anxious to talk about um, with modern purebred dog breeding. One thing is chilled semen has become a commonplace in many breeds, making cross-country breedings much more feasible than they had been previously. However, in some breeds like my own, the semen just doesn't chill well enough with many of the stud dogs mm -hmm. and conception rates are much lower than in other breeds. Do you see any advancements on the horizon that may make chilled semen more successful in those breeds? Sure. And so there's a couple things here to note. One is if you have an up and coming, successfully looking young stud dog, that you don't wait, that by the time he's two years old and you have his clearances done, that you get his semen frozen. Now, I know there's people who say, well, frozen semen doesn't work in my breed. And I've had people tell me that in a lot of breeds. And you know, we, we do have success with it in almost every breed that we've worked with. 
including breeds that I've heard. We've never produced a litter like this before with this breed with frozen semen. So number one, don't wait until your stud dog is old. I had a nine-year-old dog that came in today. He had great semen quality. Most nine-year-old dogs do not. So when the dog is between two and five and you've got his health clearances and you know he's a great dog, freeze his semen. You don't have to wait until he's got puppies on the ground. You don't have to wait for people to start asking you for semen. Freeze him when he's young. You've all been in the dog world long enough to know when you've got a great young dog. And unfortunately, bad things can happen to young dogs. So don't wait, get his semen frozen. Number two, there's a number of different semen extenders on the market. So for fresh chilled, um, there's some that are clear, there's um, some that are egg-based, some that are milk-based. There's a number of companies that make them and you don't have to be a veterinary professional to order them. So Symbiotics has them, International Canine Semen Bank has, has several. Um, there's a, a Kenny milk extender, mil milk-based extender similar to the equine extender that we carry at Revival. So there's a lot of different products that you can try. And basically what you do is you take the dog to the veterinary clinic or do this yourself because you can certainly you know, still collect semen at home. And AKC allows people to ship semen without a veterinarian's involvement for fresh chilled. So collect a collection of semen and put it in four or five, six different extenders, put it in the refrigerator overnight, take it back out 24 hours later, warm it up, look at it and see what you've got. Because pretty quickly, you'll be able to tell if you have swimmers or no swimmers. Now, most dogs should freeze or chill well in any extender. But dogs that get older with prostate disease, benign prosthetic hypertrophy or hyperplasia, dogs with testicular tumors, dogs with health problems, their semen quality might not be as good. Lyme disease, anaplasmosis, ehrlichia, all of these things that we talk about, we can certainly see dogs that have lower semen quality because of those. Um, also, a lot of it is nutritional. So don't forget to look at what you're feeding your dog, because if you don't feed the machine, you don't get the semen. So take a look at not just the semen extenders, but look at what you're feeding your dog, how you're managing your dog, what their lifestyle is, how stressed they are, where they're living, what their conditions are. So there's a lot of factors that come into semen quality um, that I think all need to be taken into account. But by all means, buy five kinds of extender, try them all out, see what you got, buy a microscope. If you don't have a microscope, have your vet clinic do this. And you can easily buy multiple extenders, try it out. For a slide warmer, you don't even have to have a slide warmer. If you have a microscope, I use my wrist as my slide warmer. So I'll put a microscope slide on my wrist, warm it up, place it on the microscope uh, stage and take a look. And you can pretty quickly determine which extender works best for which dog. And just because one works for one of your dogs doesn't mean they're going to work for all of your dogs. The father and the son may have different kind of semen and different kinds of extenders may work differently for them. So play around with it. And a lot of those extenders can be kept for months to years in your freezer. So you can, you can buy them, you know, so, so you spend $200 on semen extender. Hmm, that's not so bad if you can get a stud fee out of it. I think that's a pretty good trade-off. That's a really good point about um, different extenders working with different dogs. You know, I, I know we've talked to many breeders with, you know, they've got their tried and true brand and it's like, well, it worked for their dad. It, and we're sure it works. And lo and behold, in fact, I think we've had some semen shipped to your clinic and uh, it doesn't show up the way that it, you know, was shipped out. So right. Um, the other thing you have to be really point. careful of is that there's no urine in the semen that when it's collected. And a lot of people will let their dog urinate on the way into the veterinary clinic. So the answer to that is no, 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 no. Um, urine damages the semen. So what you want to do is immediately, if there is urine in there, that you um, centrifuge it, add fresh extender to it and get rid of the urine. But do not let your dog urinate on their way in for their semen collection. Have them hold their bladder and it works much better. Terrific. Um, you had mentioned uh, freezing uh, semen. One of the challenges we're facing in many breeds is our shrinking gene pools. Mm -hmm. We have less conservationist breeders actively breeding. We're seeing fewer high quality stud dog options, particularly with good health testing. And popular sire syndrome may be as common now as ever as the high quality dogs are getting overused. As you mentioned, you've long been a vocal proponent of the importance of freezing semen on our stud dogs. I can speak from personal experience, unfortunately, that our breeding program would have avoided some major challenges if I had always heeded your advice when you told me to get our dogs frozen. But beyond just the value that frozen semen provides for individual breeders in their programs, can you speak to its importance on a larger level for the preservation and advancement of our breeds? Sure, and <clears throat> this is a great question. So 
there have been dogs frozen, semen frozen since the 1980s. Um, we actually have some in our semen bank that goes back to Bob Hurd and uh, Hurd Merchant semen that was frozen in the in the um, middle 1980s. Uh, but at the time that semen was originally frozen, we didn't even know what to do with it. We didn't have progesterone testing. We didn't have progesterone testing in-house. Nobody knew how to put it in. If you did put it in, it was surgically done. Now we do it with transcervical a lot of times. So there's a lot of um, changes that have happened over the years. But unfortunately, a lot of people who had some of these important foundation dogs or dogs that were really critical to our breeds in the 80s and 90s that had semen frozen, they've aged out they've passed away, they've stopped breeding, they've moved into nursing homes, they've moved all together to another community. And so they have semen that's been left abandoned in the semen banks that they have. And some of these dogs are pretty important dogs, either from a genetic basis because they have semen that we can use or from a DNA basis in that we have um, DNA material that we can do some testing on. So the AKC has a purebred preservation bank now that is just getting started. We have a website that's just up and <clears throat> running. It's only been up since January, December, since December. Um, so there's some pretty cool things that are happening with the AKC. They are now allowing um, breed clubs to own the semen and to dictate how the semen is used. So if you have a situation where you have a dog that you no longer need his semen for whatever reason, either you're not going to breed again, or he's too closely related to the dogs you have, or you don't have anybody that you've mentored that you want to hand the semen off to, the AKC now has this foundation that allows you to donate your semen to the Semen Preservation Bank. The breed clubs dictate how it gets used. We've, we've put all kinds of safeguards into place, where it's going to be stored, how it's going to be stored, who's paying for it, how all these things are happening. But if you feel like the semen that you have is no longer something you want to pay for storage on, please contact the storage facility, your veterinarian or the storage facility, and make arrangements for AKC's uh, semen preservation bank to start taking that over instead of just having it thought out because once it's gone it's gone and we've lost some really important dogs that way um, it's such a shame to see that happen that I think um, most of us who are you know we've spent 30 40 50 years developing a line of dogs if we truly love the breed that we've spent our lifetime helping to create great genetics in, that we need to donate this to the AKC. Um, we can have lots of conversations about who makes the decisions and how that all works and how it's safe. And you know that your dog, if he's still alive or you have semen on him yourself, that that would get used first. I mean, AKC has thought through. We have we have a whole committee of people that have really thought through what are the ins and outs of this, um, so we can make it feel good to everybody that has valuable semen. For um, national breed clubs interested in working with the AKC Semen Bank, what should they do? Um, they can go to the website for starters. It's the Purebred Preservation Bank. And um, I am happy to, as are a number of other people on the committee, Joel and Gregory is the Otterhound veterinarian that's on there, um, Dr. Charles Garvin. Um, a lot of people that are on the committee are happy to do a webinar or a presentation live if we can get there uh, for your breed club. So whether it's your breed club at your national, whether it's a breed club at a regional, whether it's your um, breed club that has a genetics committee, we, we have a presentation we can give you and we can go through and answer all the questions. And then your breed club has the opportunity because basically AKC put together this toolkit so you don't have to do what the Otterhound Club did. The Otterhound Club was the first club to do this and I have to give complete credit to Dr. Gregory and Becky Van Hooten and some of the other people that were really critical in establishing this because AKC up until then would not allow anybody other than a group of small, a small group of individuals to own the semen. And now the breed clubs can set up their own foundation. So they have a mechanism in place for this. The toolkit exists. So basically, you just need to have a group of your um, cohorts that are interested in this. Go to the website. We already have our first donation. And I am proud to say it is a Corgi person. It is Ann Bowes. I am so happy to see that she has seen that this is an important con contribution she can make to the breed. Because like I said, if you've spent this many years developing a line of dogs that you're proud of, you should not take those to your grave. You should leave those for the next generation of people who value the same things that you value. And that's the great genetics that you've created. Well, and how valuable as breeders, you know, if, if you find yourself in a dead end, 
and you know the current stud dogs out there don't provide you with you know that next path to be able to dip back into you know your breed's heritage and potentially you know bring something forward that you know might not just save your breeding program but the breed as a whole right you know we've seen genetic problems pop up the skipper keys had a problem with mps3 a couple of years ago um frequently used sire matador syndrome whatever you want to call it they had I think 30% of their dogs had this really severe neurologic disease that had early onset and it just came out of nowhere. Well, by having semen to dip back into from generations back, we can now breed back out of some of those situations. And like I said, even if the genetic material isn't something that we want to use as an actual breeding, the DNA tests that are coming to market from all the DNA companies right now, they're coming hard and fast. And there's increasing numbers of tests that are out there which are really great tests for us to be able to use. So maybe we pull some of the semen and we use that for DNA. Maybe the semen wasn't good enough to get a pregnancy, but it's good enough to have DNA in it. Um, and there is there is a really neat organization called the International Partnership for Dogs. It's a harmonization project. They're based out of uh, Canada and the European countries. I'm on the committee for it because pretty much on every committee, if there is one, if it's got dog in the name or animal in the name, I'm probably on it. So um, that organization is uh, able to help breeders really understand how all the DNA testing fits together, how it works. They've got some really great articles. Um, AKC is a member of it. A lot of the European breed clubs are. So there's some, there's some pretty great information. It's IPFD, International Partnership for Dogs. So if people are kind of struggling with what do I do, how do I find this information, they're a wonderful resource of educational materials. Terrific. Um, changing gears here a little bit, one of the things that I'm concerned about is our modern breeders continuing the rivalry behaviors um, of the past, where they view, view their fellow breeders as competitors. Yeah. This has several implications, one of which is it can make some stud dogs or frozen semen off limits to other breeders who could really use it. Yeah. Breeders today are facing so many challenges already, things like high travel costs, inflation, dog and breeding restrictions, and so much more. When we add our shrinking gene pools to that list, we're going to need new strategies and new mindsets for how our breeds are gonna survive and advance under very different conditions than maybe they had in the 40s and 50s or 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. We need to start looking at our fellow breeders as partners and co-creators rather than competitors. Continuing rivalries and withholding information and or access won't help preserve our breeds. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? And are there other things that modern breeders will have to rethink if they're going to be successful in the future? Right. I mean, gone are the days of kennels that have 200 dogs. You know, we're just not we're just not going to see that anymore unless it's a commercial breeder. And we we certainly do see some of those in the commercial breeder industry. So really, I think a lot of the problem comes into a lack of trust. With other breeders, a lot of people are like, well, you know, they won't share the actual information. Um, they've hidden information. I think we have to be really transparent with each other. And if we've had a genetic problem or had an environmental problem, anything that might be influencing the quality of our dogs, that we share that information pretty freely. Um, social media has not improved this any. Let's face it, you know, there's no. better opportunities to gossip than there ever were before. You, you know, you don't have to sit at ringside anymore to chat with each other. You can do it on your phone. So I think really being honest with each other and working together is absolutely a critically important thing for us to do um, so that we can expand our opportunities. And you're right. I mean, being able to freeze semen, being able to ship semen is such a huge breakthrough because you no longer have to fly someplace. You no longer have to drive across the country. It's really efficient and really effective for us to be able to trade genetic material. Um, and, you know, there's increasing numbers of tools out there. We have websites that tell us what genetic tests have been done on dogs like the Chick website. We have canine data. We have um, just a, you know, a lot of great information. We have all the genetics companies. So there's just more and more information. There's software that tells you how what the COI is. There's so much information that we can pull together for ourselves that we just have to really collaborate. And sometimes the collaboration isn't within your breed. Sometimes it's with another breed. I mean, we've learned a lot from people like Pat Hastings who could effectively help us select puppies. And one of her greatest things was to say, you know, you don't have to be in this breed. We've all got an eye for a great dog. 
when we went to Europe, we saw breeds we'd never seen before at a dog show. And he'd be like, okay, that's a really cool looking dog and a really great dog. The structure of it's really good. You don't have to know the breed standard to recognize a great dog. So we can help each other even outside our breeds to, to be collaborative. Absolutely. Marty, in life, whether personal or professional, Successful people are always the ones that can overcome limiting beliefs. You see a lot of conservationist dog breeders come through your practice. Do you see any consistent limiting beliefs that conservationist breeders are holding, ones that can negatively affect either themselves or their breeding programs? Well, I think we need to be a little bit more open to um, what all breeders are doing. Um, I think that we've seen some interesting changes in um, particularly some of the commercial breeders that are the Amish, the Mennonites, and some of the others that may not have historically had a great reputation, but we're seeing uh, some of these breeders really do a pretty tremendous job. They're doing health screenings. They're improving their kennels. I've toured a number of the kennels in these um, states that have commercial breeders, and I'll tell you, I would kill to have some of these kennels that people have. These are, um, you know, maybe Amish or Mennonite people that work in the RV industry. And so they come home with materials and they come home with skills that they have built just some absolutely incredible kennels, beautiful facilities. The dogs are well cared for. They're well socialized. They're housebroken. Um, they're doing their genetic screening. They have an ophthalmologist come in. They have a trailer that comes in and takes their x-rays. They're doing heart checks. They're, they're really stepping up and doing a great job. And some of them are starting to show their dogs. And guess what? They're showing against some of you. And they may have some pretty great genetics that we don't have. I mean, we've seen some breeds that have really ended up with some pretty disastrous problems with cancer, with orthopedic problems, with that kind of thing. And a lot of the commercial breeders have a different perspective on what they select for. I mean, we have dogs that are hard to get pregnant. We have dogs that don't want to lactate. We have dogs that don't want to uh, whelp their puppies. They they may not take good care of their puppies. And a commercial breeder is going to breed for different things than we have. And I think some of the things we may need to do can either be resetting what we're selecting for in our breeds. And we're kind of being forced to in some of the brachycephalic breeds with the BOAS testing and some of the other things that are going on in the European countries. So I think we need to do some reset on what our values are, what's important to us, and not be negative toward the Amish and the commercial breeders because some of them have some really great ideas and some of them have some important genetics that I think we can include. So look for some of those because they're they're potentially going to be in the show ring against your dog. And when they start winning, and they are, I think there's a lot of value in looking to those as a way to expand our genetics, because we've bred ourselves into a corner on a lot of these breeds. That's a fascinating perspective. One area we see conservationist dog breeders really struggle with is the marketing of themselves and their dogs, especially digitally. Yeah. They didn't get into purebred dogs to become expert marketers or salesmen. Their passion is simply to breed a better dog. Right. They can then experience a lot of frustration and overwhelm in not knowing how to tell their story and differentiate themselves from the vet backyard and for-profit breeders who they feel they're in competition with to sell puppies. From your perspective, what are some things they can do to help themselves in that effort? Well, you know, we've always said, oh, I'm not here to make a profit. And I, I've never quite understood that. Yeah, you do spend a lot of money showing dogs and doing health screenings and raising dogs and dogs that may not turn out that you were hoping to be the, your next generation. But there's no shame in having a profitable product. There's no shame in selling a puppy for a, you know, a fair price. Um, we see some people that are selling, selling puppies for ridiculous prices that aren't necessarily the colors or the genetics that we really want. And they're, you know, these are people that are really successful in marketing. There's no shame in marketing your puppies and saying you have raised them correctly. You have done your genetic screening. You've shown them, you've selected for confirmation. I try to teach, teach confirmation um, sort of judging to all of my breeders, whether they show or not, whether they're in competition for field trial, hunt test, agility, if they're just breeding um, puppies for pet, the pet market, they have to have the right structure. They have to have the right 
build, they have to have the right mentality to do what they were really bred to do. If they're a hunting dog, if they're, you know, a performance dog of some type, if they're a pet dog, they have to have the right temperament. They have to have the right skill set. So I think we need to really focus on some of those things and not be afraid of telling our story. Um, I've recently started doing some marketing for our um, third, our drive-through veterinary clinic, our third practice. It's the only one in the country, by the way. Um, so we have um, learned a lot about marketing and I'm using an organization. And that's one of the things that they talk about is to tell your story. So tell your story, put it out there on video. People love watching video. Um, people love reading the stories. They want to know who you are. They want to know that their puppy came from somebody with the heart to have this kind of dog and you work hard at it. So don't be afraid to say it. Don't be afraid to charge money for what you have done because you have worked hard to get those genetics. One area where we encounter a lot of limiting beliefs is this concept within the purebred conservationist group that it's somehow unethical to make money when they sell their puppies. In any walk of life, whether it's, you know, doctors, lawyers, motivational speakers, the greatest talent, the greatest minds command the highest prices. There's no reason it should be different in purebred dogs with the best genetics should be able to command confidently a fair price for their pet puppies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you're socializing them. You're selling great dogs. You're selling dogs that are going to be a fa fabulous family member. And let's face it, everybody's first priority is that that dog is something that they want to live with. It should be housebreakable. It should be fun to live with. It should be something that you enjoy being around. So tell your story. Tell them why you do what you do. Tell them how you got started in your breed. It's it's the story people want to hear. Marty, as breeders, it's really easy for us to become hyper-focused on our top pick puppies, the ones we view as the future of our personal breeding programs. And we can forget that every single puppy we breed, whether a show dog or a pet, becomes a central piece of someone's family. Mm -hmm. Do you feel some breeders underestimate or undervalue the true impact that their pet puppies can have on the general public as a quality representative of their breed? Oh, I think so. And, it, you know, they should be, first and foremost, they should be a great family member. Um, but there's nothing wrong with having some really great looking dogs standing around in people's backyards as their pet, you know, walking down the street as, as the neighborhood's favorite puppy. Um, I have a client who was quoted in the Fleet Farm calendar many years ago. He's a golden retriever breeder. And his comment that they published on the calendar was, life's too short to hunt over an ugly dog. And I think that's such a great idea um, because we should enjoy looking at our pets. I mean, part of the reason that we select a breed, whether you know it's a, a show breed or not a show breed, is the aesthetics of it. We want to know what they look like. We, we, there's there's a thing we have in our head of what that dog should be. So whether you're a poodle person or a Labrador person, you know, the dog should be attractive to you. It shouldn't be, you know, some beat up old thing. Now, eventually, as they get old, they, they aren't as cute as they were when they were puppies. But we should have the aesthetics of a great looking dog with a great structure that can do what it wants to do. And yes, that's important to people. When people's dog gets to be, you know, when they get to be elderly, they they want them to still be able to walk out to the car. They still want them to be able to walk to the kitchen and have a meal. They want them to stay housebroken. These are really important things to people for family members. This is a dog that they're making a decision to live with for the next 15 years. We need to provide the best product that we can. And I, I don't mean to sound crass when I say the word product, but we are producing something really important for people to join in their family. And they're spending a lot of money, not just on the purchase, but over their lifetime of veterinary care and food and, oh yeah, the shoes they chew up and the other, <laughs> the other things that go wrong. We are seeing fewer conservationist breeders coming into our sport. Mm -hmm. One thing I see as an area of opportunity for breeders is the education of puppy buyers about breed activities, be it specialty clubs, shows, or performance events. Our puppy buyers are already breed enthusiasts and represent the largest pool of potential new breeders and fanciers. Mm -hmm. Now, most buyers may not be interested in getting more involved in the breed. 
They simply want a beautiful purebred dog for their family. However, some buyers may be interested in breed activities if they're made aware of what's available to participate in. Can you speak to the role better breeders can provide in educating puppy buyers and particularly ideas for attracting new people into the world of purebred dogs? Breed, we haven't really introduced too many people and personally into the uh, sport. But in the farm dogs, it's been really fun because we've been FSS, now we're miscellaneous. So it's a competition when the people show in the breed, you can't have a handler. So that makes it really fun. And I would say we probably have one or two puppies out of every litter we've produced. And we've had about 12 litters of farm dogs now. We have one or two puppies out of each litter that we've talked the people into. Now, of course, we pick the, you know, the, the nice ones that we want to have shown when we put them in these homes for them to compete. And they're having so much fun. They come into confirmation and they're like, well, you know, I never really wanted to show that kind of dog, but they want to show in performance. So we're like, well, if you're going to go to the event, run agility, do dock diving, do fly ball, do fast cat, do barn hunt, do whatever, you might as well do confirmation too. You're going to be at the event anyway. So why not sign up for that? And it's been really fun to watch these people because they they went from oh, I just want a little farm dog puppy to have hang around with me um, to, oh my gosh, I now have a dog that's got a certificate of merit. I've got a champion. So it, right. it's been really fun. And all it takes is just kind of encouraging people and then being nice to them. So, right. you know, we've been to some shows where people aren't nice to each other. So be nice to the new people. And when I'm standing outside the ring, ready to go in with the farm dogs, it's fascinating to me the number of people that are standing outside the ring that have been in purebred dogs for decades. And they're watching all the FSS dogs and miscellaneous dogs and going, you know what, that's the next breed that I'm going to have. So a lot of the people we're seeing coming into FSS and miscellaneous are coming from other breeds, but it doesn't have to be that way. We can really get new people in the sport and we need to get some young people in there too. You know, if we look around, mm -hmm. we're all kind of the same age group. So we need to encourage kids that this is fun, that it's not at all about video games and soccer games. It's about things you can do with your dog for the rest of your life. Cause that's one of the greatest things about dog sports is when you're 80, you can still go out there and do all this fun stuff with your dog. So, you know, you can't you can't play soccer when you're 80, but you can still show a dog. Yeah, that's true. Okay, I wanna throw an aspirational question out to you. Mm -hmm. Marty, if you could envision one thing for the conservationist breeder community in the future, a positive change or transformation, what would it be? Oh, you didn't warn me about this. <laughs> Um, that we have to realize who the good guys are um, in the animal world. I'm um, board chair of National Animal Interest Alliance, and they are the good guys. They are the people that want you to still be able to breed dogs, have a number of dogs in your neighborhood. If you want to eat a hamburger, that you can still buy one at the grocery store, or at the restaurant, that you can wear leather shoes if you want, that, that, that if you want to go to the circus or you want to go to the rodeo, that you can still do those things. If you want to do dog events, you still can. And I think we've seen um, so much negative press in such an unfair way about who dog breeders are, who the circus is, who the rodeos are, that we've lost some of our freedoms to enjoy some of the activities we have with our dogs. Um, I want to be able to breed dogs. I want to be able to own the breed of dog I want. I don't want to have to take the only dog that's left at the shelter that was a mix of a mix of a mix. I want the predictability of a purebred dog. And I'm afraid we're losing a lot of that because there's been this um, tendency to think that a rescue dog is the most important dog that you should have. Um, I like to know how big my dog's going to be, how active it's going to be, if it's going to shed or not, how often I have to go to the groomer, um, what kind of medical conditions it's going to have. And I think that we've gotten a lot of pressure from the wrong people about the wrong priorities. And I like the freedom of picking what I want and, and owning what I want and want to live with because I'm going to spend the next 15 years with it. I want to know. Agreed. So shortly, we're gonna open this conversation up for audience questions. Marty, before we do, are there any other topics or issues that you'd like to speak to? No, I don't think so. Be nice to your veterinary staff, be nice to your veterinary team, be nice to each other. Um, 
it's a hard world out there and we're all on the same team. Um, no matter what breed you have, no matter what your interest in animals are, whether it's horses or, you know, chickens or whatever, um, appreciate for one another, what we, what we can do for each other. We're the good guys and we need to be nice to each other. Wise words. So in a moment, we're going to open up the Q and A. If you have questions for Dr. Greer, please type them into the chat now. Um, I did see several questions coming through throughout the conversations. Um, if you had a question, if you would just retype it back into, um, into the chat at this point. As we wait for the questions to come in, I do wanna thank Revival Animal Health again for their support of this live event and the dog breeder community in general. Revival has become the breeder's best source for puppy and whelping products. Revival is also the home of Breeder's Edge, the first and only brand dedicated solely to providing the products and plans you need to keep your dams, sires, and litters at their healthiest. Discover them today at Revival Animal, I'm sorry, Rev RevivalAnimal.com. Here at the Better Breeder Institute, we serve the conservationist dog breeding community, purposeful dog breeders who are committed to the preservation and advancement of their breed. We endeavor to educate, support, and promote these breeders so that they can improve their breeding programs and differentiate themselves from the backyard and for-profit breeders. We offer several digital tools and services for our breeders, including the Better Breeder Directory, Stud Dog Register, Ultimate Breeder Website, as well as professional website design services. We encourage breeders to check them out and see which of these exclusive offerings can provide value to your breeding program. Finally, in a couple of weeks, we're gonna be offering our spring masterclass, how to recession proof your puppy sales. We will cover the five best digital strategies to sell your puppies without spending a cent on advertising. There is no cost for this masterclass. Make sure to create your own Better Breeder account to receive access to this live event. Go to betterbreeder.org and click apply to unlock your free breeder services. All right, and with that, we're gonna open this up for a few questions for Dr. Greer. Um, we have just gone over our one hour time limit that we were trying to hit, but um, I, do wanna, I do want to uh, answer a few questions here. Okay. All right. Do you recommend any certain product for a senior male that we are still using for breeding? He is a Pembroke Welsh Corgi. Yeah. Um, and there are some nutritional supplements that can be really helpful. Diet. I saw a couple of questions come through on that. Either Royal Canin or Purina are the diets that we recommend. The micronutrients and the macronutrients are really important in those. And you can't overcome a substandard diet with supplements. So I start looking at diet first. Um, my supplements consist of either International Canine Semen Bank, ICSBs, um, CF Plus, um, L-carnitine if they're having some problems with the uh, tails on the sperm, and then usually a fatty acid supplement to improve the semen quality and reduce inflammation in the testicles and the, the prostate. So it's sort of a cocktail. Um, Revival also has four supplements for male dogs that can be helpful. They have problem male, um, in between um, oxy stud, and then they have one called Get Him Going if you have some libido issues. So there's a couple good companies with products on the market that can be helpful for semen quality. Okay, um, we've got a question here from Debbie Ferguson. My repro vet spins semen samples for chilled sh shipments. Is this a good or bad thing? We spin almost all of our semen, so it's generally a good thing. Um, if you spin it at 1500 or slower RPMs, it doesn't hurt the semen. It allows you to eliminate some of the prosthetic fluid that may have blood, that may have urine, that may not be healthy if it's an older dog, and then add the extender without having it be too dilute. So yes, we spin almost all of ours and um, then re-extend with the extender, appropriate extender based on the dog. Okay, and then a question about the publishing house. Right. It's Revadon. And I think there was a link that you put up. It's Denise um, Flame, Revadon, uh, Ridgebacks and Revadon Publishing. So if you look on the uh, Amazon, you can find it. It is an Amazon published book. Okay. All right. 
Here's a good one, Marty. I've asked you this one myself. You spoke about the success rates for frozen and chilled semen. Can you speak about the success rates of bitches first litter using fresh, chilled, and frozen semen? Is there a difference? Sure. And fresh semen is always better than fresh chilled, and fresh chilled is always better than frozen. But a bitch with normal fertility should be able to get pregnant with any of those. I don't have any objection to breeding a bitch for her first time with fresh chilled or frozen semen. I know some people are like, oh, you need to try, you know, getting a normal litter out of her first. And there is some value in that, in that you can see what kind of her maternal skills she has. You can see if she's a good whelper, if she knows how to take care of puppies, um, if she can get pregnant easily. But I kind of like using a nice shiny pink brand new uterus for frozen semen because that is the most challenging semen to use. And so I have people that wait until they're eight and then they decide they're going to put frozen semen in. It's like, oh, people, no, let's do it when the uterus is not all beat up from multiple pregnancies and it's it's all happy and shiny and pink and new and it wants to get pregnant. So let's let's do these breedings when the females are still young enough to have good success. All right. You said not to let males pee on the way to being collected. Was that for freezing their semen or for doing just a regular AI? Yes, it's for any kind of semen collection because urine is bad no matter what happens. So if the dog does have urine in there, you can spin it down and add fresh extender, but this, there's still a little bit of damage that's done. So I try to keep the dogs with the, now, you know, let them urinate at your house. If you have an hour drive, then that's fine. But don't let them, you know, urinate on the door, uh, door frame as you're coming into the veterinary clinic because that's going to guarantee urine in the ejaculate. Okay. And let's grab one more. What causes silent seasons? How do you catch them in season? <laughs> well, there are just some females that like to silently have their heat cycles. They may not have much discharge. They may not have much swelling. Um, catching them, the best thing to do is have a stud dog in your house, even if he's neutered. At one point, he had um, hormones. So the easiest thing to do is keep a male dog around, and then he'll go over and point at the crate, say, ah, she's ready. So that works. Um, sometimes you just have to, on a daily basis, take a white Q-tip, a white um, Kleenex, a white paper towel, and dab her vulva, check for any swelling. There are just some bitches that have silent heats and they can be really difficult to catch. If you really can't catch her any other way, doing a monthly progesterone test to see when it rises will help you. And um, typically, if we have females that have silent heats, um, I number one, I change their dog food if they're not already on Royal Canaan, Royal Canin makes the only pregnancy diet on the market called HT42D, either that or Purina Sport 3020. Those are my two go-to diets. And then Be Strong, the, the revival product, Be Strong. And a lot of bitches that aren't cycling with good, strong heat cycles with a diet change and a B vitamin addition will start having very effective and easy to see cycles. Okay, okay. terrific. All right. We have come to the end of our conversation with Dr. Marty Greer. Marty, I want to thank you for joining us today for this live Better Breeder event. Um, I'm sure I will see you in your clinic very soon, as soon as our bitches come into season. <laughs> Nowhere else can you say bitch without blushing. That's right. It's a, it's a great opportunity. So thanks for letting me be here. It's been really fun, and I look forward to a, a lot more of these conversations. This is going to be great. Sounds great. Thank you, Marty. Good night. All right, I see uh, putting the uh, book in front of the camera uh, blurred me a little bit, so uh, I apologize for that. Um, from all of us at the Better Breeder Institute, thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Marty Greer. If there are other guests you'd like to see featured on another event, please reach out to us. With that, from all of us at the Better Breeder Institute, we send our best to you and to your breeding program. Take care.